Newton. <laughs> um, but I'm going to hand over to Adam, who's one of the Woven directors, he's an experienced cricket farmer himself, um, and he's going to lead the discussion with Joe. We've had just one question uh, sent in asking about the uh, whether different types of cricket require different farming methods. So that's something that for Joe to come back to um, when, when he's uh, at that stage. But otherwise, I think if you want to ask questions, you can put something into chat and raise a hand. Okay, Adam, do you want to kick off? Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for uh, for joining, and thank you to Joe for um, uh, you know coming along and, and help you know, sharing some of your expertise. Because I think Monkfields have been uh, farming uh, cricket uh, as long as uh, about anyone else in Europe, and you're probably one of the uh, largest farms in Europe as well. So it'd be really good to uh, hear about uh, your experiences. So I don't know if you want to start off by just introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about. Monkfield and, uh, and and how you've ended up farming insects for food. Yeah, no problem. Um, nice to see everybody. Um, so we've been breeding insects for about 30 years now. It all started as an A-level biology project for school randomly. Um, and we had, we used to have an aquatic shop in Cambridge, or my father did, and that started selling reptiles and we had to get food for the reptiles. So that's how we started getting into insects in the first place. Um, we originally did that from a site near Royston, but recently moved in 2018 to a much bigger site near me, as well as all the equipment and the reptiles as well. Um, so fortunately, the reptile market has sort of remained pandemic proof through COVID, uh, which is great. Um, the food side, however, has gone a bit quiet. I think a lot of companies aren't doing much R&D on the food side of things. Probably the biggest disasters we've had in the 30 years of breeding insects would be the denso virus um, back in the 90s, which totally wiped out our stocks of uh, the Akita domesticus, the house cricket. Um, but fortunately, on the new side, we are now allowed able to breed that cricket again. It's, it's a really virulent virus and we, on the old site, every time we tried to restart, clean out and restart with that cricket, we, we just failed. It just got the virus and killed over again. But on the new site, we're back up and running with that species. But what it has meant is we've now got, as an insurance policy, three other species of crickets that we breed. Um, we've got the black cricket, the Grillus bimaculatus, the banded cricket, the Grillodes sigillatus, as well as the silent cricket. And we also breed a species of locust as well, that's just a circle of area. Um, so today in the market, we're producing about 1 million locusts a week, about 3 million of the four species of cricket a week. Uh, we also import about a ton of mealworms, um, about half a million wax moth larvae, about a quarter of a ton of morio worms a week, um, as well as things like fruit flies, springtails, cockroaches, that sort of thing. Um, we also do sell some soldier fly, which, which uh, soldier fly larvae, again, as reptile food and as bird food. But it's priced quite high, which I always find quite strange given it's supposed to be the savior, savior insect for the animal feed market. Is at the moment we can't, it's three times the cost of mealworms for us when we try and buy it in, um, which is interesting. But I think probably the soldier fly farms are geared to just, just producing meal. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, I've got a few pictures of the site I can show you on the screen if, that, if you're interested in seeing them. Um, if I can work out how to share a screen, can I do that, Adam? I can snip the pictures out when I'm recording, can't we? I'm trying to do it just now. I think so. Nick, do you know? Are you able to? I can uh, do it, but I have to host it, I think. Ah, uh, okay. Maybe Nick can uh, switch you over. No difficult, you can just click on the person and then make host. I'll just do it here. I think you're speaking, Nick, but you're muted. Sorry, yeah. Um, I think there should be a share screen green button at the bottom. Uh, Joe, have you got that? 
Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, that's strange. All right, I'll change the settings, see if that helps. Does that work? Um, yes, it does. Um, okay, this one. Um, can you see that? Not yet. Oh, something's starting. Yep, here we go. <laughs> you can see that, yeah? Yes, that's, that's working. That's great, thank you. I go on mute again. Okay, so this is the our site's kind of split. So this is just distribution end of the site. All you can see is that tiny little green building at the front is a little food processing building we've got. Um, but otherwise, that's mainly the distribution end. This would be the live food end of the site. So all the insects are in in this building, which now has about 250 kilowatts of solar on the roof, which wasn't there when that photo was taken. Um, and we've got planning to double the size of that with the, the older buildings to the right of them. Um, so, yeah, as I say, we moved in here just two years ago. Um, it's just a shot of the sort of, for us, we've gone for quite smaller rooms. We, we've split the buildings into about 63 smaller rooms. Um, just means, especially for the, for the I think if it were just doing food, we'd have bigger rooms. But for the reptile market, it means we can we sell crickets of all and locusts of all sizes. Just easier to clean out rooms once they're empty and restock. Um, this could be a locust room. That's the breeder room in the top left. Um, locusts predominantly fed on on brassicas and also a dried food. Um, have quite a like they like quite a radiant heat the locusts we breed them at a much hotter temperature to the crickets and then the four species of cricket we do um so that's just a cricket room um again we space heat we've got the ventilation coming through the top and we recover heat from those rooms um that's just a breeder egg tray egg pot these are the banded crickets um which are a great cricket very prolific very easy to breed. Um, we also do the black cricket. Um, again, this is a species of cricket we've bred now for, again, I think pretty much the entirety of we've been going. We have, I think we bought in our initial black crickets about 25 years ago. Um, and when people ask me about <clears throat> um, inbreeding, I always refer to these crickets because we've, we've never introduced, I think we started with about 5,000, a colony of 5,000. We now sell about 800,000 of these a week and we've never introduced another black cricket into that colony. So, and they're going great and they look healthy. So I would suggest that inbreeding is not really an issue. Um, these are the house crickets. These are the ones that were cleared out by the virus um, that we do now breed again on this site, the Akita domesticus. I'm not convinced that we don't have a very slightly different strain to what we had on the old site and the, the, the old ones that did suffer from the virus. These are slightly reddier in color than the ones we used to breed. So it's, yes, they're still Akita domesticus, but are they a slightly different strain? We, we sort of live in hope that they are and they might be virus resistant in case it ever comes along again. Um, Silent crickets, yeah, they they wouldn't be suitable for feed. I don't think they're much more of a they're a pain in the ass to breed. They're easily easy to sterilize. They need a slightly more expensive diet than the other crickets. So um, we breed them because we have to breed them. Our clients like the fact that they're much quieter. Um, so that's the only reason we do them, and that's about it. There's a couple of pictures there of the human plant um, as well, where we dry the dry the crickets, we use a microwave dryer, um, which can do, it's, it's only small because we're not selling a huge amount at the minute, but um, it can do about, I think it does about six kilos fresh weight every 15 minutes or something in there. And it gets the crickets up to about 130 Celsius for a short period of time. So it kills off anything, anything that, or the bacillus cirrus and that sort of thing that might exist in the so but it's quite a good bit of kit um and you can either get conveyor versions of these or just add more units of these as you 
as that side grows, I think. And that's about it, really. So <clears throat> I'm happy to discuss any finer points. Um, but that, and that, sorry, that was quite a long introduction <laughs> of, of what we are. So shall I turn this off? Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. No, that was uh, really interesting. And um, so maybe to start on the, the farming side of things, um, yeah. the, uh, you, you, one of the questions we had in was about the, uh, some of the differences in breeding different species of crickets and rearing different species of crickets. Um, and on the food side, uh, the, the, the two main species that we're, we're looking at are the Akita domesticus, the house cricket, uh, Grelogy sigillatus, banded cricket. Um, so maybe you could uh, talk about uh, some of the differences between the two um, when it comes to, uh, you know, breeding them, the rearing conditions and, and the sort of yields you get from them. Yeah, no worries at all. So the, the, across the, across the four species, actually the, the, the banded and the house are very similar. We breed those two in very similar ways. They, they're fed exactly the same. Um, they'll take, but we, we grow them slightly hotter than the black crickets or the silent crickets. Blacks and silents will keep at 28. You go much above 30 with the silents and you completely sterilize them. Um, but with the, um, with the Akita and the banded cricket, um, we're, we're running them at about 33 to get maximum growth. They doesn't seem to do them any harm at that. And actually, <clears throat> much lower temperatures than that, we actually see a bit of a yield drop. Um, both of them, in terms of actual yield, would yield about the same. Um, bandits take about a week longer to grow. So we'll, to for food, we would always harvest at sub-adult, not adult. So um, at that pre-wing stage, <clears throat> we find you get a bit of a bit more mortality in that final molt between sort of the 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 sub-adult and adult. So we we always harvest at the sub-adult. Um, so bandage, you're looking at about five weeks to get to that sub-adult stage, whereas <clears throat> whereas the Akita, you're looking at about four weeks. Uh, the Banded, they conversely have a much higher egg lay than the Akita. So you need very few breeders or you need very few breeder replacements as well, growing on breeder replacements um, to produce a huge amount of banded. I think we get about double the egg lay from the banded as we do the Akita. Um, but the, uh, and they're like clockwork as well. We occasionally have a an up or a down that we can never quite explain in the Akita as we do with the other crickets, but the, the bandage are just, they just sort of, you can bang them. We've never had a problem with them. Um, so we'll ch so in the bandage, we'll change the egg pots every day, whereas the other species will change every two days. Um, you want to keep the humidities. We don't, we're not sort of that pedantic about measuring humidity so we want to try and keep the humidities at around 50 50 60 degrees that sort of area you wouldn't want it to go much below 40. Um, so and you need good air but you, you also need good air changes good ventilation in the in the crickets um, <clears throat> one problem with both those species is and I think crickets in general, um, and we've discovered this to our peril on this side is the whole heating ventilation. And when you're ever building a new facility for crickets, you really have to factor in <clears throat> the amount of heat they actually generate themselves. Um, so when the hatchlings first molt, second molt, you are <clears throat> pumping heat in to maintain the temperature. But generally, once they turn to that sort of third, fourth, and to sort of, sort of sub-adult molts, you're, you're almost cooling. Um, and the denser you grow, the bigger yields you're trying to achieve. You're generally, even in winter, extracting heat. So in a room, <clears throat> a room maybe 
most of our, a lot of our rooms are about six meters by five meters, by about 2.6 meters tall. Um, we may end up with a biomass at Sabado of, of sort of almost six, six and a half ton in there. So, um, so that's a lot of heat to pump out of the bit. Sorry, not six and a half ton, what am I saying? Uh, sorry, quick calculation. Yeah, so it's now done. So there's a lot of biomass to start extracting from, from a room. Sorry, 650 kilos. I'm going slightly, <laughs> slightly wrong on my maths there. Uh, but yeah, they're generating, they're alive, they're moving. And it, as that temperature starts to grow, um, there's more, it, it's, they almost get, as they get more active, um, they generate more and more heat. So you have to keep the temperatures down in those rooms. Um, we, we've had a couple of questions. Um, so the, the first one here is, um, uh, what sort of feed conversion ratio are you achieving with your crickets, and specifically the banded crickets, if you, um, you know, ha have that data? Yeah. So we're funny enough, we are getting um, about almost down to 1.4 kilos of food to a kilo of cricket, something like that. Um, so we've had better than that as well. You never quite know whether, I think crickets do cannibalize each other a little bit as well, <laughs> so, especially if a bin's overcrowded. I'm always surprised, sometimes my production manager will say it's one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes he'll come around and tell me, oh, we put a kilo in and we got a feed in and we got two kilos out, which I think the only, only way that can physically possibly happen is if they've eaten each other. But, um, but generally speaking, I think we're around about the 1.4 mm. to one. Oh, well, and that's, I mean, compared to, uh, sort of conventional livestock, I suppose you're, you know, the, the closest competition is probably poultry. And, uh, and I think the, the, you know, a typical figure there would be about sort of 1.7, 1.8 kilos of feed in per kilo of, of yield. So, you know, it stacks up quite well. Um, and then an another question, uh, talking about, you, you mentioned that the uh, crickets, especially the silent crickets have a, a different diet. Um, could you talk, tell us a bit about the different feed stocks you use and whether you use any uh, waste streams uh, in the in the feed? Yeah, exactly. We don't, and I think there's a lot of work to be done on feed and crickets as this market develops. And I think that there's a lot of good work to be done at the moment. We're using fairly high quality poultry food that's being slightly adapted for us um, at a cost of about 400 pound a ton. Um, it's about 26% protein. And you always get the argument, why feed that to a cricket when you can feed it straight to a chicken? And it's always gonna be the argument that comes back at, at crickets, I think. Um, and there's, I think a lot more work that could be done on bespoke diets for insects there's probably a lot of unnecessary stuff in that and wasteful stuff stuff that we're feeding to the cricket i mean fundamentally these diets have been developed for chickens um and we've just changed tweaked them a little bit um silence silence we add a bit more cholesterol to the diet i don't know particularly why they need that but that's something that we we found that helped and we also we were prior to that, we were feeding them a lot of greens, which were expensive. Uh, we feed we feed the locusts brassicas, which again makes them pretty expensive. Uh, brassicas we're paying 55 pence a kilo and we're ordering about 12 ton a week for the locusts. And, and for that, you're actually feeding effectively you're feeding expensive water they're eating it. Locusts won't drink, but a lot of the reason they're eating the greens as well as for moisture. Um, the locusts will also have a dried food. Other species of other species of locusts, for instance, the locusta migratoria, which has been going through the novel foods, that will that will live pretty much off grass and bran. But then you still get the argument if you um, if you're feeding the grass to the locusts, why not feed it to a sheep? So you can't really win. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> so. 
but yeah, so that as I say brassicas, brassicas are expensive. We've approached farmers for waste for outside leaves, things like that, um, of cauliflower outside leaves, Brussels tops, or potentially stuff that might get left on the on the field. Um, and it's really hard to get a reliable waste stream and be dependent on a, on a waste stream 52 weeks of the year. Um, and, and also the pricing coming back sometimes from the farmers for those for those greens for the for their waste product um, almost was more expensive than as if we'd had it grown for us because basically they're having to manually pick it off the fields um, and if they don't have a machine to do something the cost just shoots up so so we currently for any of our any of our insects we don't use any waste. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, we've had another question as well about uh, going back to the feed, um, uh, asking about the protein um, source in the cricket feed, uh, whether you um, use any animal protein in there, and also asking about whether you know what percentage of fat is recommended in the, in the diet of the crickets, and whether you supplement with any particular vitamins or minerals. Yeah, there are vitamins, general poultry spectrum, feed I haven't got it in front of me um but it's about we're about 28 percent we start them off at about 28 percent protein and drop them down to about 24 percent protein after a couple of weeks after the first couple of weeks they don't eat loads in those that first week or so anyway um but that just starts them off well fat content of the food I can't remember um off the top of my head um and there is a, effectively a broad spectrum of vitamins and minerals within that diet. Um, we have a small inclusion of fish meal, which we'll probably for food have to end up taking out because we repeatedly, people don't want fish meal in it, which I can vaguely understand, even though fish meal is a byproduct. But the, the insects do, 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 we did see if, uh, an improvement with the fish meal added. So the protein, the protein is mainly made up of fish meal and soya. Um, and again, we've been asked for GM free soya. And my, my feeling is why. Um, I think GM gets a lot of bad press. Um, GM is designed to be drought resistant, yield more per acre, everything else. Um, and so I don't, I don't really see effectively GM free soil and needs more agricultural land area to grow the same, same, same amount. So I don't see why people are asking for that um, <clears throat> or why people, why that's an advantage. If you're trying to pre produce something sustainably, to my mind, GM makes it less sustainable. I'm not an expert on that. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think there's there's a little bit around the diets. The more if you try and go fish meal free, you might we might lose a bit of yield. GM free will just increase the cost. If we're trying to uh, if we're trying to keep this as an economic product, economic as well as being sustainable, you've got to be realistic that it's got to be fed something uh, that's got to be relatively cheap rather than keeping loading cost onto the feed. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, uh, a question here from uh, uh, about uh, cannibalism and whether you think cannibalism is a problem and is it more of a problem for any of the species in particular? Um, I don't think it's a major problem. I think if you've got the bins well overcrowded or locusts will cannibalize quite quickly if they haven't got any food. Um, part of that is their food is also their moisture. Um, crickets, it's more, as I say, in that final molt, obviously they're quite vulnerable at that stage and you'll see them molting, they're very soft. Um, and that final molt is where we do see the biggest cut um mortality and i think they do hammer each other in that mold um and they are yeah they're quite a fragile product at that stage so but i think up to that stage it's not it's not huge one thing you do know 
is the meeting eggs. So, so with the breeders, um, you've got to be a little bit careful. They're not going around eating all the eggs that are being laid as well. Yeah, thank you. And um, so we've got, had a question about the about novel foods, um, but maybe if we focus on the farming first, and then we'll sort of then tackle the food side in a sec. Um, so uh, this question here about uh, you. So you've given you've given us lots of data and and uh, and statistics. Um, do you do a lot of the research and data collection yourself at your own facility, or do you um, use uh, published research and external reports? So everything everything we've done, we've kind of learned as we've gone along. Occasionally. You'll read an article and it might make you think about doing something a little bit differently, but I think of an example now off the top of my head where we've done that. So it's generally always been trial and error and we've changed a huge amount from how we started. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, it's we've, we've kind of just learned as we've gone along. So self-taught, self we've, we've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and improve things over the years um but it's mm. we, we still we're still learning i think that's probably the case with a lot of um i mean obviously i haven't been farming uh, insects nearly as long as you have but i think uh, even now with a lot being available on the internet um it's still sometimes difficult to translate laboratory studies into you know real life farming situations and uh, so we've certainly found ourselves that there's a lot of trial and error and trying to come up with a system that works for you at your site you know with with your 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 processes so um yes. you know i think uh, there's probably more that can be done in the future to try and make the the that kind of farming uh, uh, sort of know-how available and a bit more um uh, standardized really yeah um so uh, the question here about heating, because I think there's um, some of the, uh, you've probably had feedback before, you've mentioned the crickets themselves generate quite a lot of heat, but that it might be uh, inefficient to be farming um, you know, insects at high temperatures or tropical insects in, at a temp in a temperate climate. Um, so I don't know if you could give us a bit more uh, information on your heating system and or your insulation and you know, how much of your heating comes from solar throughout the year? So the ventilation, all of that is coming from solar. The heating, we have a 200 kilowatt biomass boiler. Um, so that's using a wood pellet. Um, so basically how the work is, we'll, we, we'll generate, we have a massive air handling unit, which is bringing air into rooms and that's that's handling all 60 rooms as big a handling unit <clears throat> it, it aims to bring air into the rooms at a constant say 25 degrees and as it enters each room each room's on a sort of goes over this heater coil again which is hot water and um, that should raise the temperature up to the required temperatures that we need or so we can cool at the air handling unit end, but not at room level. And this is where we're having a few issues um, because even delivering air at 25, um, if it's a room full of adult crickets, um, that they, those, those rooms are overheating. So we've got, we're slightly tweaking things. Well, we're hugely changing, we're gonna do that. So, so effectively, yeah, all heat by mass, and a lot of the fans are driven by the by the solar um, and we're probably going to put in more solar as well because um, we still have an electricity requirement now i think <clears throat> also we recover heat so on the extract side all that all the heat is then funneled back to that air handling unit and, and goes through heat recovery um, I, we're looking at now potentially new ways where obviously you've got particularly on the cricket side locusts we're locusts were running at 38 degrees so we are very rarely cooling locusts but with the with the crickets um with the crickets i think almost if we can 
have a system that takes heat out of the adult rooms, putting heat back into the rooms that require heat. So 24, 52 weeks of the year, we've got some rooms pretty much that need heat and simultaneously rooms that need cool cooling. And we're, we're working with a consultant at the moment who with some tweaking thinks you, you could almost be, be circulating air to, from room to room. Um, so you can actually reduce power costs heavily by taking heat out of the rooms that um, you've got to get rid of heat and putting it straight into the, the rooms that require heat, et cetera, et cetera, without going all the way around through the air handling unit. But um, we will see. I don't know. I, it's, I'm not an expert. It all goes a bit above my head sometimes. But um, I think we still have, we, we have scope to greatly reduce our power. <clears throat> um, and then in hot countries, I don't know, Mexico, you'll have a very different problem. I mean, you're probably, I don't know whether you're cooling more than you're heating or whether you're using neutral heat. So temperate, tem so hot countries would, would have very different problems, I think. Yes, they might have their own heat, but they'd probably be, if they're trying to grow in any density, they're always probably going to be cooling more than they are heating. So. Thank you. And, um... Uh, another question about um, uh, light cycles and light dark cycles and um, how important that is for the for, well for, for the crickets and I suppose the locusts as well. We generally eight dark 16 light. Um, a lot of it works around our staff <laughs> which I shouldn't say but we, we, we years ago we were quite pedantic about measuring daylight, day, night, and it didn't really make that much difference. As long as there was a day and a night in terms of light, I think that does benefit. Um, <clears throat> but the number of times I'll, I'll go and look at time clocks or something and someone's overridden the time clocks, they've gone into a room at a funny time and realized probably for the past week, the lights have been on 24 <clears> seven. <throat> um, and it hasn't made any difference really to the yield. It does make a difference to the yield if they're in constant darkness. Um, so they do need some light. But um, I don't think it hurts them to be in 24 hour light. And um, we've another question here about the, uh, uh, about the conditions in the breeding rooms and about um, CO2 and oxygen. I guess you're introducing a lot of fresh air. So, uh, you know, maybe that's enough to keep CO2 levels down. But do you, do you measure CO2 and do you know what sort of ranges would be uh, acceptable? They measure it, we've never measured it. Um, and uh, we have a pretty big, so we would probably be running at up to three or four air changes an hour for the room. So um, I don't think we would ever have an issue with CO2 at that level of air change, as long as the rooms are well ventilated. Um, it's something we've never measured, probably should have done. As I say, it's a, <laughs> we, we may be different and, and, and I'm sure maybe you could get better yields or better growth rates. I, I don't know, but you look at the bins we've got, um, wait, Adam, you've seen some of them. Um, I don't think you want a lot more out of them, um, a lot more growth or, I mean, the actual biomass of the insects in the bin is pretty much filling the bin. Um, and we take an attitude a little bit that as long as you get the environmental controls that we see are right to produce those volumes, you could start spending a lot of money on sensors and data and controls. But for us, it hasn't really been necessary. I'm slightly like that with automation as well. I mean, we, we automate what we can. Um, maybe there's more we can automate, but, um, but you, you look at some of the plants and the robotics and everything else from what you can see on the internet of other farms and you just think there's a lot of A, capital cost gone into that automation and potentially a lot of maintenance and upkeep costs and, and a lot that could go wrong. And, um, and, and the payback on the cost, initial cost of that, if it wasn't grant funded in the first place against 
what is actually going to save you. I don't know. It's I'm, I'm, so we're maybe a bit old fashioned. <laughs> so, so it's right. Um, well, it's obviously obviously for you there because you you know getting good good yields, good fee conversion ratios. And uh, the question here about your frass and the, um, uh, the the waste that you produce and um, what you do with it, whether you use um, an anaerobic digester or burn it um, with the biomass. So we don't, because the biomass will only take a pellet, so um, we don't burn it. So at the moment, we live in the middle of, sort of a lot of farmland and the farmers take it to spread on, on fields. We don't charge anything for it. Um, we are working with a hydroponics company um who are or trialing it now and taking some of it so um we haven't had the results back from that yet so it's always been <clears throat> it's always been spread on farmland but but if, if we can have a add value to it by selling it to a yeah company will do that um so. and uh there's a question here about scale and um, uh, and cost effectiveness. And do you know? I mean, uh, I guess you're farming at a fairly large scale. Um, do you think that there are um, uh, big savings, or is, is more cost effective to farm at scale? Yeah, I think when you're farming at small scale or large scale, you'd always as long as you factor in your own labour costs if you're doing it small scale. Um, but large scale. I mean, obviously, in order to put in the the heat recovery, the the, the systems that you want to try and keep your energy costs down, um, you're not probably going to make those investments on a small scale farm. So you'll probably get energy savings on on large scale, uh, definitely. Um, also, things like automatic watering and everything else, relatively expensive to put in, and um, so. We've sort of saved money that way. I suppose large scale as well, you're learning a lot more. <clears throat> um, so you've got, you can change rooms, you can change different, have different rooms set slightly differently just to see what sort of results you get. So you can probably progress quicker if you're in a large scale environment. Um, but so yeah, I would say there probably are, but equally, I don't think those, I don't think they're massive. Um, as long as if you're doing it in a small scale in a very insulated building and, and, and put the most energy efficient system in you can I, I I think I think you can do pretty well to be honest I don't I don't think it has to be a large scale operation mm, thank you and um and then a question about the your cricket bins the boxes you rear the crickets in um, uh, are they just uh, regular bins and uh, do you use lids? Don't use lids. Um, lids, lid, we do get it. We get, we get escapees, obviously, but we put some tape around the top and, and they can't get out. If you put that sort of shiny tape on or in the locust, we actually um, put just brown buffer tape on and cover it in lard. <laughs> they just slip back again, not very high tech, but they just slip back into the boxes. Crickets, um, if you lid them, you're, you're gonna reduce the ventilation heavily, then you might start getting problems with um, either CO2 or humidity buildups within the bin. Um, so also, once you start putting lids on, you're adding to labor because every time they're doing anything in the bin, they've got to take the lid off and that sort of thing. So our watering system is a drip system, which wouldn't work with lids either. So, and our bins are pretty much just regular off the shelf bins. I would change them actually. Um, <clears throat> they're a bit ribbed on the outside, which gives places like spiders somewhere to cling on to, but, um, and, and make us, so I would make them smooth sided if I did them again. Um, but, but they're just standard off the shelf plastic bins. Um, and then there's a, a question here, a few parts to it about uh, the substrate that the crickets lay their eggs in, um, whether you're able to reuse the substrate, um, what, whether you measure the, the uh, 
incubation temperature and the environmental conditions of the, the substrate when you're incubating it? And how much time do you leave the itin with the crickets laying eggs? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we don't reuse it. <clears throat> um, it's actually bad at the moment as it's peat. And, and now there's, you shouldn't use peat. Should you? Peat's a major... Um, it's a major carbon store as we're here in the Forestry Commission getting into trouble at the moment on the news. But um, so we are actually now changing probably to more of a sand sawdust type mix and moving away from peat. Um, but which is how we started and it gives similar results. Uh, we don't reuse. Um, so I think it would be, I think, <clears throat> I think maybe you could reuse one thing that most cricket farmers will experience at some point is build up of, you can get some alpha tobias beetles in your culture or you can get um, things like that. And, and I think you're just encouraging sort of disease or other problems if you re as we incubate at the same temperature that we grow in um so we don't measure the actual substrate um temperature at all so our uh, eggs are incubated at about 30 celsius which is similar to the room temperatures of the cricket um, and they'll hatch they have slightly varying hatch times i think the banded are eight days the blacks so might be a day sooner but they look they're pretty much like clockwork if the rooms get slightly warm they hatch slightly quicker um <clears throat> but only by a day or so and then um and was there another question there yeah and the only other question part of the question was how long do you leave the substrate in with the crickets Oh, I think you mentioned. Yeah, so two days. So with the Akita, every they Akita and Blacks and Silence, we change every two days, and the Bandits daily, and the Locusts daily. And so I think that you mentioned then about the, some of the issues with reusing uh, substrate um, and, uh, and pest buildup. And there's a question here about pest control and uh, biosecurity. Uh, and do do you have a problem um, with? pests and and what measures do you take to to control them yeah so the, the there's two beetles which are a real pain one of them is is the alpha tobias and one of them is a i think it's a peruvian dermastes beetle i don't you know more associated with chicken again i think as as often you see it on chicken farms and that sort of thing um and they are annoying i think they can predate on the eggs or on the baby crickets i i don't know whether they do hugely but it it's interesting if we get a drop in yield you always see an increase in the beetles and you don't know whether it's chicken or egg or which way around it's <laughs> it's happened um so we will obviously you can't use any insecticide the best way we found of combating it is at the end of the cycle you completely clear out rooms disinfect rooms do everything you can to kill everything in that room before you restock it and you always then keep the levels right down that way and flies are another one you, uh, so yeah you, you've just got to keep control of flies as well <laughs> Um, and then uh, the question here, and it sort of ties in with a report that came out earlier this week about um, problems that might be associated with um, uh, large scale insect farms and uh, escape, the escaping of, of non native species. Um, so the question is whether um, you have any um, serious escape issues and um, whether um, any of the species that you rear. Uh, might be a, a problem if they do escape, and it, are you regulated in any way? Well, this all came to press with I'm a celebrity being in Wales, didn't it? So, um, which we we actually supplied them. We thought this might happen, so we did it for a third party. But it's um, it's Wales in that environment. We 
we obviously have to get planning permission for what we do. It's a bespoke use, breeding crickets. It comes under a three, three generous use. And we have to, we've been asked to put certain measures in to try and stop too much escapees, but we've never had any issues with, obviously, obviously insects escape, they, they go everywhere. Um, and, and winter time this time of year they'll just die it's cold um and also they'll get eaten by the birds or whatever so we always we had an amazing not so much here actually but our last site we had an amazing wild bird population around the farm and which was nice but but equally obviously we're supposed to be controlling so we did put as much as we can in to stop stop the um, stop them going everywhere also hedgehogs as well. We had a great hedgehog population at the old site. <laughs> and, and we liked it, but, but from a planning perspective, yeah, we were supposed to be keeping everything contained. Uh, great, and it, so probably we've been going for a while, so it might be good to move on to the food side of things. Um, and uh, so you've been um, rearing crickets for or insects for human consumption for, for a few years now. So what got you into it in the first place and what uh, sort of changes have you seen um, since you, you, you first started uh, producing f f insects for human consumption? So, yeah, we probably, we, we, I mean, obviously it started appearing in the press and we, we, we always were interested in it. We always felt we'd be in quite a good position to do it having bred the insects so it's it's a market we've kept an eye on as I said sadly I think it was starting to gather a bit of momentum and then Covid hit which sort of quietened things down again a bit fun enough but on that side but now we do we are talking to early decent player who's starting to put some R&D into the product in terms of how to utilize the product. I think initially, it's always quite interested me at the moment we've sold more for us. The main, we've had a bigger market for whole dry than we have for powder, which wasn't expected. Um, as you know, Adam, we don't produce the powder, so um, getting you to do it now, getting it spray dried. Um, so, um, it, getting contract done um, processing I think still is a bit too expensive and if, if, it, if the market was going to grow it still needs to keep that cost lower um, I think the big thing on the food side is 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 the why we did some work with um, with our market a little bit of we we, we we did start a website which is cricketfoods.com or as a wholesale supplier site for the food side and the big question the marketing company was keeping asking us is why where are your product going to be utilized and why obviously is the sustainability argument um but whilst the cost is still a bit high um are people still going to eat them and i suppose they're the arguments that you really have crickets have to find their place um on the food side which i'm sure they will i'm sure they will but at, at the moment you see bars you see um the sort of standard things that people sell crickets in and i think there's a there's probably better products out there that they could be utilized into um would be my feeling hmm. and um so that leads us on to a question we had earlier that we'll, i'll just go back to uh which was about the um uh, eu novel foods regulation um obviously we're, it's that's been going on for a while now and it, this transitional period sort of been extended and, and as yet I don't think any of the application dossiers have actually been approved. Um, so how do you see that process working? Do you think that they, um, you know, do you anticipate that they will be approved and, you know, any species in particular that are likely uh, to, to get approved first? Uh, we, we Sort of joined in with the Belgium Insect Federation to a degree on that, but I haven't been very actively involved with them apart from 
sort of chipping in occasionally, but it's um, or joining a couple of meetings. It, it seems like the mealworm, mealworms are probably furthest ahead. I think um, I think a banded application. I might be wrong. Fell by the wayside. Um, but, uh, I think there is another one coming. Um, the Akita one, they came back and asked for a load more data, I think, which is a shame. I mean, the Belgian people submitted all their data for Akita or the various farmers in Europe. Um, and then the Novel Foods said all the information, sort of, they all collaborated and certain farms would do provide certain bits and Novel Foods then recently came back and said uh, all the data had to be collected from a single farm, so <laughs> that delayed it, and they've had to go back and redo a lot of that data. Um, so I think a lot of frustration and, and red tape. Um, so I think it'll, it'll get there, but it's just taking a long time, and it, these, these applications aren't cheap. Um, or they're very time consuming or you have to pay someone else to do it. So it's frustrating being English. I mean, we're leaving Europe. Will those regulations just be adopted in the UK? I don't know. So it's, it's a bit of a gray area and that will be a, a certainly until they become registered in novel food, which again, I'm sure they will. Um, it's always going to be a slight obstacle to growth. Although people do seem to be carrying on and selling regardless, but yeah. And um, I think uh, there were for, for a lot of, uh, well, for a while, um, Thailand, uh, crickets from Thailand, um, weren't on the uh, approved list of, of third countries that could uh, import uh, crickets into Europe. They think they originally, they, you know, we a lot of crickets were coming in from Thailand. Uh, they were off the list for a, for a bit, but I believe they're back on the list now. So people, you know, uh, crickets from Thailand are allowed to be sold in Europe. Um, and they tend to be cheaper uh, than what's produced in Europe. And I was just wondering um, whether you thought that, um, you know, how you saw that playing out with, do you think that cheaper imports from Thailand, for example, are, are a threat to European producers, or do you think there's a place for European producers, you know, to, still? Or, or could or could European producers um, uh, get to the stage where they're cost competitive with imports from Thailand? Yeah, I mean, I, again, it goes back to that whole argument of the sustainability piece, doesn't it? And um, and why people will eat them in the first place and if they're being flown halfway around the world is that a sustainable product da, 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 da. and actually i haven't actually known i don't know the thailand pricing now and it's come down a bit but if you're looking if you're taking a frozen product with, before processing um looking at uh cost i think at the moment we're we're probably sub four pound a kilo. I think we can get that down to below two pound a kilo. And I think so, which I would have thought by the time you've flown a cricket from Thailand to the UK um, or Europe, I think, I think yes, the UK could be competitive against that. I think you'll need, that's where you need to get your maximum outputs per square foot in terms of yield and everything else. Um, so a bit of capital investment, which you've got to appreciate, but but yes, I think you can be, I think we will be able to be competitive. Um, I know they potentially grow outdoors and everything else, but they've got to be regulated to some degree, I would have thought, so. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and so if anyone else has got any questions on the food side, they can, they can post them on here. And then in the meantime, we've had a couple more questions uh, about frass. Um, I think you met you, I think you might have said that your biomass burner um, takes only takes wood pellets so there's not an option to to burn frass so that might answer that question and um, uh, and then a question here about frass being an income generator 
um, and, uh, and why you don't sell it, or do you think there is a market for it? I do, I do, I do. And um, we, to be honest, it's probably slightly laziness or not focused on it on our part that we've never sold it before, but uh, we have finally um, started to take, um, and as I say, well, the farm has always taken away, taking all the muck away and it's never been a problem. It's never been an area we've really looked at as priority within the business. Um, but now, as I say, we, we started about a few months ago working with this hydroponic supplier who was interested in it. So it does take some work at our end. We have to fill, we have to sieve it, um, take out anything that's any impurities from it. And that includes any eggs or potentially the beetle larvae that we have within the crickets that are tiny. The last thing they want to use is fresh in their sort of nursery type products and then get a load of bugs in the fertilizer effectively. So they've asked us if we can freeze it for 24 hours or 48 hours prior to sending it to them, which is a bit painful. So, but I think as a general garden fertilizer, which is is regulated in itself, I think. So, so um, yeah, we haven't. To be honest, it's slight like laziness on our part. To be brief. <laughs> <laughs> or lack of time. Um, and uh, is it, so back to the food side. Question here um, uh, about Brexit and looking forward. And has um, Defra or the FSA given any indications about what will happen post Brexit when it comes to insects for food and feed? And what will be the default situation? I think we'll just probably adopt European stat rules to start with. And we, we, we do a lot of different things in this business and, and we can't even get told how we're going to take stuff to Northern Ireland at the moment with the live insects. So, I mean, it's, it's so, so Brexit, no, there's been no guidelines. <laughs> And it's a great frustration. You're currently paying a consultant um, quite a lot of money just to try and look at all of our import exports across the whole business. And um, but even they're scratching their heads, and there's two weeks to go. So um, uh, so as you've got the live reptiles, we've got various different aspects of the business, and it's there's just so much, and just well, there's no there's nothing out there to answer these questions at the moment. So, but my guess with the food is I'll just adopt the European stance on it initially to start with. It's not really going to be priority for them at the moment, is it? So. No, no. And um, uh, and I think we, we normally try and keep the webinar to about an hour, but there's another question here. So maybe we'll, we'll answer this question and then uh, maybe get your thoughts about the, the future as well. And it's probably hard to say but what the future might hold for insects for food. But um, uh, Fernando's asked uh, whether you could give us a step-by-step -step, um, process on actually um, on getting dried crickets uh, for human consumption. So I, I guess that's a question about um, from sort of harvesting to actually having a, a, a packaged product to sell and what steps you use to, to have that fit for human consumption. Yeah, so we we will, um, from harvesting point, what we'll do is we'll starve the crickets out for 24 hours before we, so we'll just give them a moisture source so that we'll take all the food away, everything away, um, keep them in a slightly cooler room and just let them, I think it's similar to what they do with snail farming, just empty their gut content um, for, for 24 hours. Well then, freeze them, uh, which we understand to be the most humane way. And um, from the freezer, we'll then wash them. Um, and from having washed them, filter them, we've made sure we've picked out any, if, if any beetle has got into them or anything like that, make sure that's all separated and sieved off. Um, from there, we will we'll dry them. I think the important thing is keeping records and traceability. We've got cells or accreditation now, but it's it's all about traceability from 
food supplies and everything else. So as long as you've got traceability of every input going in and every output going out, then I think um, you're okay. But that's about the process. Perfect. And then maybe we could, because the hour's up, and I don't want to keep you, but uh, maybe we could end by uh, just getting your thoughts on, uh, probably hard to say, but what the future might hold and, and, and how you sort of looking forward, how you see insects as a food um, uh, panning out. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's a huge amount of interest here in, in food. And, and I think I, I, I think as they get used in more of a diverse range of products. I do think flour will be the future as opposed to whole dried. As I say, at the moment, the whole dried seems to be the more popular thing, but I'm guessing that will generally be a novelty thing. Um, so, and as that ingredient gets, gets used and as it comes down in price, which I think it will, um, as the processing gets better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you've got to see some growth, but it's, I think until until you get a slightly more diverse range of products out there and it really finds its niche within the market, um, it's probably going to remain relatively relatively small, but small is still pretend, could be still quite a large market when it comes to human food. So. Um, but I, I don't think it's quite found its, it, it, its rightful place yet. Uh, in the protein market, powder market, you're always competing against whey. The bar market is a saturated market anyway on protein. So um, I feel there must be an area for, for crickets that maybe people are starting to, to research and play with a lot more now. So. I'm sure it will find its way in the world. It's just it's getting that volume hook to um, to make it grow into a bigger market. And actually, at the moment, it, it couldn't be a mainstream market anyway because there isn't enough production of the things in the first place. So it's got to remain quite small um, until it and um, uh, while people experiment with different products to use it. And um, the cost, I think, is that. I think the costs will come down. I think um, I think when people say you've got to encourage people to eat a product that they potentially are repulsed initially by on sustainable reasons, and I think they always assume, or certainly when I say to people um, eat insects, they always assume they're going to be dirt cheap because they're insects, and that's not necessarily the case against other forms of of meat or protein to it to, to a degree that's great well th thank you very much and uh yeah i think that's been really useful for for everyone uh we've covered loads of stuff there so um you know ho hopefully people will be able to take something from it and uh yeah i don't know if, if you've got anything else you want to say before we wrap it up or um it probably covered most things there Good night, no, yeah, all good for me. If, unless anyone else has anything, then um, thanks for listening. I hope that wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, was, yeah, really good. And uh, yeah, like I said, so this will be uh, recorded and then put up on YouTube as well. So anyone can go back to it if they think they've missed anything and, uh, and just go over what was said. Um, yeah, perfect. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. See you. Right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Bye. Bye. Bye.